Hello, this is Jeffrey Fox here again. And uh, the second of the uh, slide sets on Twister 2 with some overall features in a little more detail than the first slide set. And uh, all right, let's get on with it. And here we have a, um, a repeat of this. And um, we can have some interesting numbers like the total amount of uh, of um, code in various parts of Twister 2, and also the APIs, which is pretty important, because one of the key differences between, say, the classic HPC MPI and the Hadoop framework is Hadoop has a much better API, or at least for initial users. So here we have the Big Data API. And um, this, uh, say, was the first to sort of enunciated with MapReduce, where we had automatic parallelism. I, I should say, historically, parallelism always was automatic to begin with in the simulation world. But as simulations got more and more complicated, the automatic methods failed. And one had to go with, more, with less user-friendly methods, because it was just and it's not totally clear to me that that's not going to be true in big data. As you go to more and more complicated big data, where you strive for more and more um, performance in difficult problems, where there are various optimizations that are rather boring but make huge differences in performance, uh, the automatic methods tend to not look so good. All right, so here we have um, different APIs on existing systems. We have um, Peak Elections and Apache Crunch, which is uh, the original version, which became Apache Beam. Um, we have RDDs in Spark, we have, um, which effectively implements, uh, well, it's currently a major implementation of Beam uses Spark. We have Flink with data sets and Streamlets and Storm. And we need to also, in this level, we have to look at the task graph, which is in Storm and Spark, and we also have to look at SQL-based APIs. And the higher level data API hides communication and decomposition from the user. And if you want to customize that, which we know we do for simulations to get good results, then you have to go to a, a low level messaging and task APIs. Um, so the user API creates graphs. Uh, by you just do it dynamically, you spawn a new graph, effectively spawn uh, new processes, which gives you effectively defines um, the node of a graph and the data events, which are the chunks of data, throw through the edges of the graph as messages, and they go from process to process and. I say at the node boundaries, the data node boundaries, you can automatically checkpoint as well as actually making RDDs are effectively a checkpointing technology. And this gives you, this is sort of the basis of fault tolerance in these models. And here we have a picture of uh, two um, nodes um, transmitting events to, well, these could be map nodes or bolts, and this is a reduction node. And the graph, you have to be scheduled, and that gives you a plan, then gives you a plan to execute that schedule. Uh, the HPC APIs are dominated by MPI. That is currently really the only clearly successful HPC API. And I've told you it's built around the challenge of in the simulation world, which is much older than the data world. The problems are really and not intellectually necessarily harder, but they've got more complicated. You have to do really sophisticated, irregular decompositions because you're simulating things like the early universe with huge variations of density. And that means simple, regular chopping up, which is what uh, Hadoop and Spark does, is the wrong way to do the problem. Um, and so the MPI allows you to control communication, control the breakup. And um, so there are some task systems and data APIs in HPC built on top of this, such as Legion from Stanford, which is built on top of CUDA. And the so-called active messages, which are much nearer the data flow model, which uh, Twister 2 has. 
And one of the key things we actually have to remember is the difference between models and data. Because when we do um, any machine learning, the machine learning has parameters in it. K-means has the centers of the, of the um, to be discovered. And you need to think carefully about the data and the model. Both often are very big and have to be paralyzed. And that is not always done in a careful fashion. So this is described here in, the, in these two slides. We have to separate data and model in, in, in all these systems. And uh, it's unfortunate that the word data is often used for the parameters of the model. When I wrote the original papers on parallel computing, I'm sure I used the word data, because I always thought of everything as data living in the computer memory, even when the data was actually the um, uh, values of grid of the pressure and velocity of the atmosphere, say a, a, the a weather prediction uh, mesh that was stored in the memory of the computer. So models come from users. Uh, there is a sort of concept such as uh, SQL databases or deep learning. There are parameters, and uh, the results are determined by the computation. So the final values of, say, k-means <coughs> are the, value center, the, the values of the centers. Uh, big data have data and model. I've already given you the um, example of k-means with the cluster centers for the a query. The model is the database and the result of the query, whereas the data is the whole, is the structure of the database with tables and rows and columns and things. And the data is the whole database queried and the actual details of the query. For deep learning, the model is the network with all its links, a huge model, and then the data is the images which you're trying to classify. Um, so in simulations, we have the same situation, data and model. The model could be the set of all the pressures, velocities, what have you, for a climate or weather simulation, or it's um, if we're doing the early universe, it's the galaxies and other parts of the universe that we chopped up to do the simulation. And the data, well, the model is always large for simulations. For data, it can be small. If you were doing quantum chromodynamics or the fundamental particles, you just need to probably specify the size of um, um, the, the number of dimensions of space time, which is four, then you get the answer because it's a fundamental theory. Uh, there are other cases with, say, data assimilation, which is weather forecasting, whether the simulation is actually informed by boundary conditions, which are actually adaptively changing with time, which come from the measurements, uh, which are then fed in to guide the simulation. A big data it always has large data by definition. The model can vary in size. Um, deep learning is the most e clearest example with large model clustering of dimension reduction. <coughs> Don't have small models, but they have modest size models. The data is always, always static, unless you're streaming when it, it sort of is static within a window. The model parameters change, because when we're doing clustering, we start with a guess for the cluster centers, and then we iterate to evolve that guess. And I say I, I am responsible, and many people in the field for confusing these concepts. And if you look at models systematically and data systematically, then you get some convergence <coughs> between big data <coughs> simulations, which I've described. All right, so this slide here tells you a little bit about the size of the different parts of Twister 2. The overall integration with Kubernetes, Mesos, and Islam, 15,000 lines of code. Uh, the task system, it has a scheduler and an executor, um, has 10,000 lines of code. So this is a uh, healthy uh, 25,000. We have 20,000 in the data flow operation, including the communication routines, twister.net. Fault tolerance, not so much. 2,000 now, we need to add 3,000 to get some fault tolerance. The most important near-term thing to do, the Python API is 5,000, we're estimating about 5,000 lines. 
T sets, not so big, 2500. Compatibility with Storm is 2000. Apache Beam, if we implemented that connection, would be somewhere around a few thousand lines of code. Uh, we have to do the uh, different parts of data flow, which is the, the ones we have to add is called connected data flow. The internal data flow is up here. Connected data flow is the data flow of asynchronous adding new parts to the system. That's 5,000 with another 5,000 or so lines to be added. Data access API for HDFS, uh, NoSQL and so on is 5,000, adding 5,000. Then we have to do connectors like RabbitMQ, MQTT, but that's another pop system. Um, SQL, uh, Spark SQL is the most popular part of Spark, HBase. Um, we have a thousand of them for Kafka, and the, all these different connectors could be up to 10,000 lines of code. There's a whole set of utilities, 9,000 um, lines of code. And the application test code is 10,000, and the dashboard is 4,000. So this is a total of 80,000 lines of code. And you can see here we have um, some 40,000 lines we might want to add in the next uh, six months or so. Here is the um, how it's decomposed by language, uh, with 80,000 sitting down here. It's 80,801. That's when this was compiled a couple of months ago. And uh, notice the lines of code do not include comments. There's 30,000 lines of comments, 19,000 blank lines, and 1,000 files. And you can see it's dominantly Java, Python. And then XML and JavaScript, and the rest is very small. Um, so that's main. And then actually, if when we add unit tests, that will make an enormous. Unit tests are very voluminous. They're not very difficult to add, but they do add a lot of uh, volume to the data, to the st overall um, size of the system. Here we have a sort of architectural diagram. Uh, we have here basically submitting a job. Or here we have a submitting multiple jobs connected together by data flow. Then we have the actual application. And that application uses Python, SQL, Java, uh, Scala. Where the ones in orange we haven't actually done yet. So that's the three. Uh, APIs of which Python is the most important and SQL might be the most valuable. And we have the runtime, which has T sets and state. We have the task graph system. We have the MPI style bunk synchronous processing. We have the data flow and twister.net. And then we have the uh, resource managers and schedulers, Mesos, Kubernetes, the standalone model, and Slurm. And then we have data. Either from messages streamed from the edge, stored on local disk, HDFS, or NoSQL. So these are the APIs: the resource API, uh, the user API, the orchestration API, and the data access API. And here we have some examples of how you might use it. Uh, here we have these operator levels. Remember, we have operators. We have to emulate Spark with its 80 operators or transformations. And then you would have a Java API. It would invoke, say, the data flow, to, in, which ca carries with it the uh, operation. And the, that's all done on the workers. Um, if we want to build the task graph, we would use Java or Python. And um, we'd have maybe a, the Java API or the T set, the task graph, the data flow operations. And then, of course, it's again all run on the workflow. So this tells you how um, higher level APIs uh, are built on top of the task graph. These are the lower level APIs, the MPI, BSP, and the Twister.net API. Uh, the Twister.net is a little easier than, than an MPI because there's a data level, not message level, but they still require the user coping with a lot of detail. And these APIs, which are the programming models, are built by, in terms of this toolkit, by putting together the different parts of the toolkit.
Here we have um, the le levels of API. The ease of use is the TSET, which is the equivalent of the Spark RDD. That's equivalent of the Spark API. It's the easiest to program. It's the functional style programming. It has support for types built into the into T sets, and it's especially suitable for simple programs where you just need ease of use is the most important. The task API you actually abstracts the t threads and the messages. It's an intermediate API, and the operator API is the hardest to program. And that's where you would you say do graph analytics with or latent Dirichlet applications. These really hard parallel codes. And you have more flexibility and performance at the bottom. Lots of perf high performance, highly flexible, lowish performance, super easy to use, good to get started with. Uh, here we have a view of the actual runtime structure. Everything starts with a driver, which um, could be on the client, but needn't be. We have a dashboard, which is actually the monitoring um, the Twister 2. So you can see what's going on. It allows uh, the user to query the dashboard and look at the status of their job. We have for every job a job master. This is again like um, a system, remember that from Hadoop. We have these worker processes, and the scheduler allocates the resource uh, units uh, to, to handle the workers and the various system components. And the user, of course, programs the worker uh, with the tasks. And the cluster resources are managed by Mesos and Kubernetes, or Slurm. And the resource unit is typically cores. Kubernetes has parts, Mesos has tasks, and there's the compute node as well as uh, cores. We've already stressed the fact that data flow graphs in our model are intelligent. In that we uh, do not wish to do automatically anything at the data flow node, because that makes it too inefficient. If we always persist the T set at the data flow node, then we're, for an iterative problem, we're in trouble. If it's not iterative, you have to persist it, because you only go through that node once. If you're doing an iteration, you go to each node the number of times equal the number of iterations. So you may only want to actually persist. Um, every 50th uh, invocation of that particular node. And we want to, as we now believe, that we need to have machine learning monitoring the execution of every code. We want to enable the wrapping of machine learning at every data flow node. Say so the data flow nodes are always the natural synchronization points. In MPI, we didn't really have data flow. The synchronization was at the MPI core, which effectively defined a data flow node. And it's where K means would have a data flow node over the MPI core. And these are intelligent nodes are meant to support the customization of checkpointing, the communication, the linking with machine learning and the communication. And these nodes, as we stress, can be coarse grain or fine grain, which require different strategies. And that's shown uh, here, the different uh, grain sizes. And this is coarse grain, which we see in NiFi, Pegasus, and things like that. Um, we have a workflow controller. We invoke jobs here. And they're very asynchronously and coarsely linked, probably by disk. Fine grain, everything streams. Nothing is ever written anywhere unless there's a desperate need to do it. And we have things like MPI processes communicating automatically between processes and never writing anything anywhere except from memory to memory. And we need to have both coarse grain and fine grain, and that's illustrated on the next slide, which is the last slide of this set, where coarse grain is these big red blobs. These are different programs. Prepare the data, cluster the data. Dimension reduce the data, visualize the data. This is, these are large jobs. This is what NiFi, Taverno, Kepler, and things can do. Inside any of these jobs, I'll have something like this, which is K means clustering, lots of maps because we're running it in parallel. There's a reduce operation to find, they sum up the contributions to all the centers from what's been calculated in each map. Typically, each map takes each center and calculates the components of the data points assigned to that map. And we must be able to do efficiently this type of data 
those nodes, and this type. And to do that, you have to have different mechanisms. You can't use the same mechanism. It's a mistake to use the same mechanism unless you don't care about performance. And Twister 2 hopefully has the intelligence to be able to use the right mechanism for the right for each grain size. Okay, the next uh, set of slide set is the last slide set of this uh, more than a dupe uh, presentation. We'll describe some performance measurements we've done. Thank you very much. This is Jeffrey Fox ending the second slide set on Twister 2.